Hey everyone, so good to be joining you. If you listen and look, you might guess where I'm standing right now this evening. It's an absolutely glorious evening. The sun is just about to set and it's terrific just to be in this spot. And there's a reason that I will share with you in a few moments why I'm on this spot. I hope you can hear me. I'm not bothered whether or not you can see me or not, but I want you to hear me because something absolutely wonderful happened this week and it is just tied in with my daily devotional that I've had this week. So I want to take you back to Wednesday. Heather and I have just pulled into a little shop. Heather's went in and she's getting some bits and bobs and then she comes back out and she says, Mark, there's something leaking out of our car. And so I get out of the car and I get down on my hands and knees and I look under the car and sure enough, drip, 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 there's something that is leaking. And I'm under the car and if you know me, I know nothing about cars. I know absolutely nothing, but I was sure of one thing, that there was something leaking underneath the car. But the next thing I heard this voice saying, you, you all right, mate? And I peeked up and there was this guy standing. And of course I said to him, look, there's something leaking out of the car. And the next thing I know, he's on his hands and knees and he's under the car too. And he says, sure enough, aye, there is something leaking. He puts his hand in and he takes his hand back out and he starts to sniff it and he starts to smell it. And he discovers one thing, it's not petrol and it's not oil. And so the two of us are on the ground looking underneath at this drip, 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 and not one of us can do a thing about it. But then something wonderful happens. We start to talk about spiritual stuff. And then he asks me this question. He says, mate, do you really believe in a second chance? And so I said to him, why do you ask that question? There must be something that provokes you to ask me that question. And so he starts to share his story, he brought up in a Christian home. And one Saturday evening, he went to Kelly's nightclub and on that Saturday evening, he took an ETAB. And that spiraled out of control. And before long, he was taking a lot of harder drugs. And so he tells me with a tear in his eye that his poor mum pressed for him every day. But he thinks, he thinks in his heart that there's no hope, that he can't have a second chance, that he's messed up and he's gone too far and that God has given up on him. And so here I am, and I've come this evening to this spot. And I just wish you could see the height of this cliff behind me. Because a number of years ago, this is where I stood. And this is where my life was falling apart around me. Broken, confused, messed up. And I came to this very spot. And yet I was crying out to God, wondering, could he give me another chance? Could he restore me? Could he forgive me? And I looked at the guy, his name's Martin. And I says, you're looking at a guy that not only had a second chance, but is living proof of a third, fourth and fifth chance. And so during my daily readings this week, I've been going through the book of Jonah. What an amazing book. If ever a guy had a second chance, this guy had the second chance. And so I was reading through the book of Jonah and I came to this amazing verse. Jonah 3, verse 1. You should get your Bible and you should read this with me. Here's what it says. And the Lord, the word of the Lord, came to Jonah a second time. Isn't that absolutely incredible? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and Jonah had been on the run. God had given Jonah a specific task, a specific role, a specific ministry. And Jonah decided that the best thing that he could do was just to run away from God. You see, as human beings, when someone messes up, we tend not to give them a second chance. We tend to put them in the scrap heap and say, well, I give that boy or that girl a chance before. And that's it. They've had their chance. They're not getting any more chances with me. But I am so glad 
so absolutely thrilled that I can tell you that God is the God of the second chance. God is the God that wants to forgive, restore, and get you back up and running again. So I'm reading this verse. And I'm saying to myself, God, you are so amazing. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. How incredible is that? Just to hear God speaking to you a second time. And so I shared this wonderful message with Martin. And yes, in the midst of all his drugs, in the midst of all his e-tabs, in the midst of all his ecstasy, in the midst of his co cocaine and snuffing and all his dope, I can tell him that God is a God of the second chance. Maybe you're watching this and maybe you're thinking that you're too far gone. You're too far through. God could never ever speak to you again, never ever use you again. And I want to just tell you something. See this book? This book is the Bible and it's absolute truth. And I'm so thankful that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Isn't that incredible to know? And from a human perspective, we have got this so wrong. And how do I know that? You see from cover to cover when I go through this, let me tell you, it was said of Abraham that he was too old. God could never use him. He was far too old. It was said of Noah that he was a drunk and so he was. How could God ever speak or use someone that got drunk. But yet he did. It was said of Jacob that Jacob was a schemer. He was a liar. He was one that absolutely stole, stole the very birthright that his father was going to give to his brother. But I love this. Jacob became the father of many nations. Isn't that incredible? And even though he was a liar, even though he was a schemer, God says, do you know what, Jacob? I'm going to give you a second chance, boy, because I've got my hand on you. I have got you earmarked for something special. And then you could flick on over. Do you remember Rahab? Rahab, isn't the Bible so brilliant because it doesn't gloss over anything the way we do in churches today. Rahab was a prostitute, a prostitute. And you would think that God would sort of pass by the prostitute and, and not use the prostitute, but yet God spoke into Rahab's life. Rahab was used to hide the spies. Rahab hung the scarlet thread out of the window. And when you go over to the start of the gospels into the lineage of Jesus Christ, isn't it amazing that you will find Rahab's name in the lineage where Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes through. A prostitute in the lineage of Jesus Christ? How amazing. Then you can think of Samson. Do you remember Samson? Oh, Samson was a womanizer. He was a big flirt. But yet God had his hand, his finger upon Samson's life. And yes, he got his hair cut and he shouldn't have got his hair cut. And yes, he went down and got himself a prostitute. And yes, he went down into Gath and he done all those tragic, tragic things. But yet God says, I've got my hand on you, Samson. I have got my finger on you. I have got you purposed and planned for a particular work for you to do for me. Oh, I could tell you so many more. What about Joseph? Joseph? What a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet Joseph was abused by his own brothers. And yet God in all his love and all his mercy, God takes Joseph out of a pit, out of a pit and places him in a palace. I want to stop there. Folks, isn't this amazing? God wants to lift you out of a pit. And I can tell you, do you know what God says in the book of Psalms? This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his fears. Do you know what else it says? He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet upon a rock and he steadied me, steadied me as I walked along. Folks, isn't that incredible? That God right now wants to take you, 
wants to take me out of our mess and set us among princes. He wants to put a royal robe of righteousness upon you. He wants to clothe you with the garment of salvation and the garment of praise. Joseph got a second chance. What about David? Oh, you hear so much about David. One of the most quoted passages that you will ever hear right throughout Ireland, in fact, right throughout the globe, is Psalm 23. That a wonderful psalm where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall never be in want. But yet David committed adultery. Folks, I'm stopping there. Did you hear what I just said? David committed adultery. He then set, sent the husband Uriah out to the front of the battle to cover his sin and get Uriah killed. So not only adultery, but now he's involved in murder. And yet in Acts 13, 22, you get your Bible and you read this. Here's what it says. God says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Did David get a second chance? Yes, he did. He messed up big time. You only have to read Psalm 51. David comes before the Lord because Nathan the prophet confronts him and tells him this story. And then Nathan looks him straight in the eye and says, David, you are the man. It's you that's at fault. And David comes completely broken before the Lord. And he says, Lord, against you and you only have I done this evil in your sight. Oh God, purge me with hyssop. Wash me. I will be whiter than snow if you wash me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Do you think God heard him? Can I tell you God heard him? You see, when you come repentant, now I want to stop. And I want to emphasize this word. This word is losing its effect and it is losing its power and its meaning right throughout evangelical circles. God wants to see repentance. Maybe I'm speaking to you and you've messed up somewhere. And you think all hope is gone. And I've tried to show you some examples from the Bible where God says, you know what? Yes, you may have messed up. Yes, you may have failed me. Yes, you may have fallen but I have my hand on you. And if you repent, what do you mean repent? You see folks, repentance is more than just coming to God and saying, I'm sorry, and going back to your old habits. That's not repentance. That is just remorse and feeling sorry for yourself. Repentance is when you come before God and acknowledge that against God you have sinned and you have fallen short of a standard and you have messed up and you take ownership of your sin and you come broken and humble before him and say, God, I have sinned. And you turn from your sin, you turn and you're going one direction and then you turn and you face this other direction because God has come when you have repented and he has cleansed you and he has forgiven you and get a hold of this. Do you know when you repent from your sin? Do you, you know when you turn from your sin? The devil will come and he'll come time and time again and he'll try to remind you of your past. He'll try to remind you of your sin. He'll try to remind you of how much you messed up and that you'll probably mess up again. But here's what the Bible says. When you come as a repentant sinner and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation and see that Jesus Christ took your sin, your mess up, your failure, your loads of absolute mess ups and shocks and horrors. And when you see that Jesus Christ and Calvary's cross took them. Here's what he says to you. Your sins and your iniquities, I remember no more forever. Isn't that incredible? Did you notice that Jesus Christ didn't say that I forget your sins? Because you see, the problem with forgetting your sins is that someday 
he could remember them. But when you repent of your sins, Jesus Christ doesn't say, I forget them. He says, your sins and iniquities, I remember no more forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. It's not incredible. Jesus Christ chooses not to remember them. In other words, you get a clean canvas, a clean slate. Folks, let, let me paint to you something else before I finish. Because I know I'm speaking to someone and you're struggling. You think that you've gone beyond the reach of God and yet God is pursuing you with a heart of love because he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. Just this week, I was out with my youngest boy playing golf. I hadn't been with Luke for a few days and I just wanted to spend some time with him. Neither of the two of us aren't really that good at golf. But there's one thing in golf that I absolutely love. Now, you maybe don't know anything about golf. Maybe you know something. But there's a thing called a mulligan. A mulligan. It's one of the most precious things that I love in golf. What does that mean, a mulligan? Well, let's just say I step up and I hit the ball and I think it's fairly good, but then I watch it and the ball veers off to the right and lands in the pond. And I've lost my ball. I turn to Luke and I say to Luke, you know what, Luke? I'm going to take my mulligan now. In other words, don't count that, that mess up, that failure. Don't count that shot. I'm going to start again afresh. And so the bad shot, the mess up, it is erased. And I take a new shot and start afresh again. Folks, let me tell you, God wants right now to let you start afresh again. You're looking at the guy. I'm so thankful. Father, I'm so thankful that you've taken this guy and you've given him the second chance. Isn't that amazing? And I finish. Isn't that amazing that in Jonah, as he runs away from God, God has a fish, a big fish, already prepared to swallow Jonah up, to keep him alive, to preserve his life, because God has his finger and his hand upon him. Look at that. Jonah 3.1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah again, the second time. Folks, if you're a believer and you've, you've messed up somewhere, God wants you to get back up again. Come on. Get back up, lift yourself by the lapels of your coat and pull yourself up. Doesn't matter what the Christians say, doesn't matter what the church has said. If you're repentant, you're forgiven and God wants to restore you. Maybe you're not a Christian yet. You have messed up big time. I've been with a young lady this week who has had an abortion. She is beside herself because she's had this abortion. She thinks it's the unpardonable sin. I want to tell you it's not. Yes, I have to be honest, there has been a murder has taken place of a fetus, a live fetus, but I assured her that God, Jeremiah 17, do you remember that verse, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Folks, you don't even know your own heart, so don't tell me that you've got a good heart. I hear this so often. Oh, he's got a good heart, she's got a good heart, or they've a nice heart. You haven't a clue what sort of heart a person has. There's only one knows. You find it in the very next verse of Jeremiah 17, verse number 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. God knows your heart. God knew the heart of that young girl. God knew what she was up against. God knew how the pregnancy came about. And I assured her this week that if she confesses, if she repents, God wants to wipe the slate clean. He wants to give her the second chance. Thank God. And I'm standing here on the cliff edge and I have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I have 16 young people that are sitting now in the bank in their wetsuits listening to this. And I want to tell you, young people, I want to tell you, you've been listening, you haven't shouted, you haven't roared. I want to tell you that God loves you and that God 
wants to give you, young people, a second chance, a fresh start. He wants you to come to him and trust him for salvation. Folks, in this video, I'm finished. The second chance, thank God. Thank God he's the God of the second chance. God bless you. Have a great week. Contact me if I can help you, if I can send you booklets, if I can even come and pray with you. I'll gladly do it. I'm your servant for Jesus Christ. Bless you from Ram Moorhead.